but the Mets do hold them off with six outs from Edwin Diaz, which is something that set up perfectly because he hadn't pitched in a long time, not something that he normally does, and I don't know if this is something he's going to continue to do, uh, but he was able to have a dominant eighth inning, a little bit of a dicey ninth inning, and then they got bailed out by that weird check swing 3-0 and to end the game. But this is what you wanted, especially with the pitching matchups. We said yesterday, if you get this first one, that sets up really, really well for you. The Mets got the first one. Good morning, Sal. How you feeling? Great. And, and look, maybe we're undervaluing or underestimating Carlos Carrasco because you're right on the, the matchups everybody's worried about. You know, Walker's been dominant and Scherzer and DeGrom. And you look at Carrasco as maybe a guy who that Braves powerful lineup could get to. To his credit, he did the good job. Hey, look, you get to give up a home run. It happens. Acuna's a great player. Braves are going to hit. They're going to score some runs. I mean, I didn't think the Mets were going to win these games easily. And by the way, you don't get style points. doesn't matter. Just win the freaking game. Now, you would have liked less stress, obviously, and you would have liked not having to go to Diaz for two innings there. But they did the job. And I just thought you, know, you, you felt it watching. And the, the tone was set early on. Yeah. They came out. They're the home team. Carlos Carrasco set the tone, shutting the Braves down. Then the offense goes out there, goes to work, score a run early. Alonzo with a big home run, obviously tacking on more. The Mets did their job. Naquin, you know, the, the guy that they trade for, everybody's like, oh, who the hell is this scrub? He goes out there and shows you he could be a solid upgrade over Jankowski. It was a nice team win and a great start to this huge five-game series. I think you saw the best and the worst of the trade deadline yeah. last night. Now, Billy Epler is probably walking around with a smirk on his face when Naquin's hitting the two home runs. Vogelback hits another home run, and he is contributing seemingly every single night. So he's probably walking around going, all right, everybody can get off my ass for <laughs> the offensive stuff. Right. But then again, you're in a situation last night. Now, I know that they had to use Lugo when they didn't want to use Lugo in the last game of the National Series, and maybe... Maybe that would have changed some things, but I'm not so sure even if Lugo was fully rested and didn't throw those eight pitches or whatever it was the day before. I still think that maybe Buck would have gone to Edwin Diaz for those six outs. But if they did have somebody else or acquired somebody else like a David Robertson, what would have happened was you probably still would have seen Diaz in the eighth against the meat of the lineup and then another pitcher that you trusted in the ninth and the Mets don't have that other guy right now. And nobody is on the level of Edwin Diaz. And he was fully rested. And Buck gave it a shot. And I, I liked what he did last night. But that's something that projects in the future. And that is a hole that this team has. And honestly, my feelings watching it were, A, I didn't love the decision to have Diaz go out there for a second. Inning. I get it. And it was the best option. I just didn't love it. Because then I'm thinking, this team screwed up. This is the only thing that they needed. You look at the lineup, and I was talking about it a little bit with CeeLo during the warm-up show. Like, this is as loaded a team as they have had. I mean, mm -hmm. they rise. McCann, I know he stinks, but he's batting ninth. That is a deep lineup. So offensively, we can nitpick and say they didn't get this guy, they didn't get that guy. They're fine offensively. Their lineup is solid. It's good. The rotation, come on. DeGrom, Scherzer, Walker, Bassett, mm -hmm. Carrasco. I mean, we know the rotation is loaded. What and we know the bullpen has holes, but if they just had one guy that you could trust outside of Diaz, it'd be a totally different story. And that's what made me mad about last night. This could be a complete team if they went and got a legit eighth inning guy. And not to make you matter, but this is something we have talked about prior to knowing this team was going to be this good for months. Right. Beginning of the season, oh, they'll add to the bullpen. It's obviously a position of weakness for them. They will add to it. Billy Epler, when he makes the the Vogelback trade says, well, it's a very robust reliever market, so we feel like we can deal a guy like Holderman and not really miss a beat, and we'll go out and acquire some guys, and basically you bring in Givens, that's it, and you don't feel any more different about the bullpen. Trevor May comes back, but still, you feel like there was an opportunity missed there. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with you with the frustration there, um, but still... I think that the dominance of Edwin Diaz takes a little bit of that frustration away because right now there is nobody in Major League Baseball that is touching how great he is. And if that continues into the postseason, that's a weapon that is going to be unleashed that the Mets really have, haven't had in a very long time. I mean, you think about some of their closers that were dominant at times. Like, you know, Benitez, dominant regular season closer. Right. Never really trusted him 
in the postseason. You know, Billy Wagner, same type of thing. Um, you know, K-Rod, you think about Jerry's Familia, had one of the great regular seasons that we had ever mm -hmm. seen from a closer, yeah. but if you're putting him in a situation in the postseason, you don't love it. If he pitches like this, the Mets will have something that I don't think that they have had in a postseason run in, you know, years and years and years. I can't speak on Tug McGraw, yeah, but it's right. the best that I've seen in my life. Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't... And look, 86, again, different story with the Roscoe McDowell. Um, we're talking about, like, recent history here. And I, I do think when all said and done, Edwin Diaz is going to have the best season. I mean, look at look at what he's done, dude. This is sure. historic. Like, it's it, not it, stopping it, either. It is going to be the best season for a closer in franchise history, and maybe by far. But I loved Familia in 2015. This is different. And it could be a weapon. I just – see, where guys thrive in certain situations, right? Mm -hmm. I hate the idea of trying to mm, – let's see if we can get a little bit more, like – he excels in closing out ball games, or or just in the one inning against the best team, against the best part of the lineup. Eighth inning last night, fine, or ninth inning normally, whatever it may be. Asking him to get two outs, uh, two inning saves regularly, I feel like at some point that's going to catch up with him. Now, maybe not. Maybe it doesn't. You're right. It is a weapon, and it's great to be able to go to a five out save, whatever it may be. Maybe this doesn't have to be the two complete innings come postseason time, and maybe they could find somebody to bridge that gap. It's a great weapon. I just. I worry a little bit because he's excelled and so great with the one inning. If you bring him out for the second inning, it does lose a little bit of what yeah. he is. To me, though, this was circumstantial more than anything. Like, I wouldn't really worry about that being a thing, especially in the regular season the rest of the way. And the, re the circumstances were that led to this. The rest that Diaz had. Right. The fact that Lugo had pitched the previous day when he wasn't supposed to. And it's the Braves, and you feel like if you got this first game, because we talk so much about Buck and the preparation and going ahead and whatever, and this was a, and Carrasco's been great, but still this was one of the pitching matchups that you were like, all right, the Braves probably have a little bit of an advantage where the Mets have an advantage in some of these other games. I think Buck was like, I'm not messing around. I mean, you said it yourself, I heard uh, with CeeLo, you know, maybe 75% of Diaz in that ninth inning is better than 100% of whoever else you're going to put out there. It was best option. Hey. So I don't think this is, something like oh we saw him do it now and now we're gonna have him do that three four five times the rest of august and september also you had the heart of the braves order up in the eighth inning that played a factor and that the mets couldn't tack on in the ninth which by the way is one of the reasons why i love the idea of a manager going to the closer against the best part of the order in the eighth inning because in the ninth inning your team could tack on mm -hmm. and then you don't have to worry about it exactly so they, and they had that opportunity i thought they were for a little while and maybe take the the you know the the pressure off of buck and diaz and go with somebody else but you're right the circumstances led to him going the two innings he got the job done he's not going to be available tonight which is fine and you hope that the Mets bats and I do think Buck looks ahead and says well Anderson's been awful for Atlanta mm -hmm. this is a night where our lineup is going to go out there and win it for us and we trust Walker to give six seven innings and I could figure out what Lugo maybe could give you a two inning uh, performance himself I do think he looks ahead to that I just don't want it to become a thing in the postseason I feel like you push and go to the well too often I, i'd be afraid to get burnt and in the postseason as you know all it takes is one and you're screwed yeah and it's going to be tempting for him right. because as we said this season that he's having is unmatched and there really isn't somebody else that you're saying all right this is locked down eighth inning bridge to diaz i mean the, the bridge to diaz is a little bit scary now the, most teams that have you know playoffs experience and and uh, you think about what they lack when they get knocked out the bullpen is the thing that everybody always talks about right. so it's not as if the Mets are in some sort of unique position you know, there's very few teams that you know maybe you talk about like the Indians a few of the, the former Indians mm -hmm. a few years ago or you know you saw the Nationals deployed their starters in the bullpen but it's it's very rare when you go into the postseason and you're like all right seven eight nine the Royals that one year had it sure um but outside of that it doesn't really happen but they still need it to upgrade at the trade deadline I'm just trying to say like you've got a dominant right. closer and some other good guys you still should be okay with the rest of this team and, and by the way you know who the guy to get was and you look at the Yankees Brian Cashman tries to load up on that bullpen all the time I mean yeah. now they may not have not all those moves may pan out but at least they have options where we look at the Mets and say, well, it's got to be one of these three have to become that eighth inning guy. Cashman's got like 10 guys who you could say, all right, well, 
a couple of these guys, some of them got to develop into guys that we could trust. So wh who would you rather have? What what situation would you rather have, though? Like the Yankees right. who are struggling to find who... Now, I know that Holmes has been great, but I mean... Well, have he you, has. Yeah, I know. Ha have you seen him recently? And then Chapman rounding into shape? Maybe, but who the hell knows? He's so volatile. You know, so yeah, there's right. a lot of arms there, but I mean, I'd still rather have the the game is over guy. And right now, the Mets have that. The w guy that they should have added, and I know we've been focusing on Robertson, and I'm not sure they could have gotten him because of the prospect match, whatever. But Iglesias was the guy. Yeah. Because and I'm not saying he would have been dominant or a known thing here, but if Iglesias is in that game in the ninth inning after Diaz, you feel good about it. And yeah. say, okay, let's see what this guy can do. Because he's been at close before, he could have been that guy, and it would have cost money. That's the issue. So when everybody's talking about the prospects, at least the way that I understood it and read it after the fact was, the, I think it was Joel Sherman had it in the post, that the Mets could have had Iglesias if they were willing to take on the money. Atlanta did. Atlanta has him. So not only do the Mets miss out on an arm that they could have used, he goes to the Braves. And I just I just don't understand it. Like, I don't understand how you and I can sit there. And I get that fans are going to be irrational and illogical at times and, you know, not have the patience or discipline that organizations need. But is that asking too much? No. A, a clear weakness that they had. Like, I'll, I'll live with Vogelback and Ruff. Fine. And Naquin, I get it. Even though we wanted the sexier name, the splashier name, I get it. We'll live with it. And I do think the offense will be fine. However, how could you sell that bullpen with this loaded rotation, with this very good, if not loaded, lineup? How could you sell this rotation, uh, but this bullpen? Yeah, I, I wonder how everything played out there with Billy Epler and the swing and the miss and how you lost out on two of these top relievers to teams in your division I'd, I'd love to know how it played out was was it his fault I mean did he even get an opportunity to pitch that to Steve Cohen about bringing in somebody right. just for money like I just I, I wish I knew how it all played out and we're, we're never really going to know and my fear is and I, I think your fear is that we're going to be watching postseason games and still thinking about the last couple of days when they didn't upgrade when they needed to. That I mean, that's the biggest fear. Well, think about the feeling last night. It was uncomfortable. Yeah. And I know that it's a tight game, and, you know, the Braves are a good team, and it's never going to be, you know, rocking chair or that comfortable in that spot. And that's what I'm thinking. Oh, my God, I don't know if I can handle this stretch of the postseason like this. But you hmm. feel a lot more comfortable if you had another arm. And look, you may get beat anyway. Maybe they get Iglesias or they get Robertson and those guys get beat. Fine, it happens. But right now, you, there's nobody there that you could go to that you feel good about. Not Trevor May, not Lugo. Now, as I was saying before, they need one of those guys. Tyler McGill, mm -hmm. Trevor May, Seth Lugo. Somebody's got to step up and be great for them. One and it's possible. Three. It is possible yeah. because Lugo's done it before. Uh, Trevor May's been a good reliever before. And I do think Tyler McGill has potential. One of those three. Now, if they ever get two of those three, forget it. But one of those three has to be the seventh slash eighth inning guy that you could trust you know, it, along with, I guess, Adovino to a lesser extent. And obviously, to get to, to Edwin Diaz in the ninth inning, but I would have liked one more arm. And I, even though McCann has been brutal, I loved what he said yesterday about, you know, even though they were trying to acquire a catcher, they did not, and it shows the faith that they have in us, and I really want to be able to show them what I can do because they put the faith in me. That's what I want, that same mentality from those guys in the bullpen. All right, you didn't upgrade here. We are the guys that have been here, so show them. And, oh, by the way, you know <laughs> – you, if you become that guy at any point in your career in the postseason, it pays off for you. Like, if you have a great run in the postseason, Just if you're one. Trevor May or you're Seth Lugo or, or, or let, let's say uh, McGill goes into the bullpen, at some point in your career, that becomes a part of your resume, and then people are going to want to pay you for that. So this is a tremendous opportunity for those guys, and it's not out of the realm of possibility that one steps up and is great in those big moments. And by the way, you could throw Givens in that bunch too i know that yeah. he had a terrible first outing with the mets he was pitching to a 2-6 era he's just another on that at least has the potential i guess to be a guy that could get some eighth inning out yeah i know i just i feel like because he was the guy we ended up with and his initial outing oh God, like know. none of us are looking at him right. as a savior it's sort of like a joke at this point now right. he's got an opportunity to prove us wrong like billy taylor remember when they got oh billy my taylor God, you know? billy taylor <laughs> Jesus. Uh, remember that? I forget if it was the, was it Terrence Long or something like that? They made a trade to get <laughs> Terrence Billy, Long, yeah. Billy, yeah. Uh, Billy Epler, uh, Billy Taylor from uh, from the A's. Oakland, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, I remember that. And he was a dominant closer at the time for the A's. The Mets got him, he did nothing. Who was your least favorite Mets reliever of all time? Probably a tie between Bobby Parnell. Okay, and that's a good one. Mel Rojas. 
Hmm. You know, those are two good ones. And it might be more in there. I mean, there were some lousy ones, as you know. You know who I really Doug dis- Henry, remember him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he was awful. <laughs> the one, the guy I irrationally hated was Mike Stanton because he was a Yankee. He was so good with the Yankees. He was so good with the Yankees, and he came over here, and he, st- he wasn't, like, the worst of the worst, but I hated that guy <laughs> in a Mets that, uniform. Yeah. I could not stand yeah. Mike Stanton. And then Benitez, I, I had a lot of, like, good Benitez yeah. moments. Like, I remember going a ton of games during that tenure and getting excited when he came in, but, like, obviously, like, to just – the blow-up potential for him was was horrendous. Yeah, right, and usually in a big spot. Yeah. He was still good, though. I mean, overall, I think you look – I don't look back at D- at uh, Benitez being one of the worst. I look at Parnell. I look at, like, Braden Looper. Um, yeah, you know, Looper. Even those guys, you know, when they got better, I mean, you know, for years they were nothing, but when they got a little bit better and some of the closes they tried to run out there were just embarrassing. And Benitez – you know, at least he got you know, it done. He gave them. a lot yeah. of great right. moments. I mean, well, he's one of the better seasons you've ever seen from a closer. Probably the, the second best, right? I mean, other to the familiar season and what Diaz is doing, and it's not complete yet. But, I mean, he had a 50-save season, right, uh, Benitez? Uh, one yeah, point? I, I think it was. Yeah, Was yeah. it 2000 he had a 50-save season? I think it might have been. Yeah. yeah, one of those years. Yeah. He, right. He was. I mean, if you rank top five closers or top three in our Mets lifetime, uh, let me ask you, Benitez or Franco? See, I love John Frank. Me too. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the red bell so you're notified when we have new content.